guys, we are back with another super fun interview. Today we're talking to Eden Robinson, who released her memoir, Becoming Shameless, last year. Welcome to the podcast, Eden. Yeah, thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Yes, we're super excited. So as Caitlin mentioned, um, you just wrote a book recently. Um, so can you tell our audience a little bit about what Becoming Shameless is about? I wrote it uh, shortly after reading Jeanette McCurdy's memoir, uh, I'm Glad My Mom Died. Um, and so as I was reading it, it just, I remembered a lot of things that had happened um, growing up. And, uh, and you know, I'd also, at that time, I just, you know, I'd, I'd come out about, you know, six years previously. Um, and so I was working through uh, internalized internalized homophobia and lesbophobia and all of that. Um, and so all these things were just kind of percolating in my brain. Um, and so, you know, then when I read her memoir, I was like, that's, I, I relate a lot to these experiences. Um, you know, and there's also this whole like homophobia piece and like coming out later in life, which I feel like isn't talked about enough. More people are talking about that, which is great, but um, so yeah, I was just like, I do like, what if, if I wrote down all my thoughts and experiences, how many, what would that, what would that be? And then I wrote it down. Uh, I got like the first draft finished within a week and I was like, I, th I think, I think I have a book here. Um, and so then I just was just kind of learned along the way, you know, about self-publishing and all of that. So, um, but yeah, but to answer your question, um, it's basically about, you know, my experience growing up, surviving an abusive childhood, um, and navigating that and healing from that, uh, and also unlearning a lot of internalized homophobia and realizing that I'm gay when I was like 27, uh, which is a fun time to realize that, you know, so it's, it's about both of those. And, um, I wrote about both of those experiences because recognizing that 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 this dynamic I had with my primary parent was really abusive like recognizing that and also recognizing that I that there are all these you know societal expectations uh of me to be a straight woman and how that doesn't align with who I am um you know unlearning both of those uh, unlearning the, those those uh, expectations um, and kind of learning how to kind of be like oh, that's 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 not about me. Let's put that over there. Uh, that doesn't need to be a part of my life. Um, you know that there's there's some interconnectedness there. So so yeah. So that's it's that's what the book is about. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who can relate to everything you went through growing up. So why did you decide that now was the time to write and release your memoir? Um, I mean, I, I, it was more just kind of a like, you know, after reading Jeanette McCurdy's book, I was like, do I have enough for a book? And then I wrote it out. I was like, I think this is enough for a book. Uh, and so then I just, I just did it. <laughs> it, it wasn't like a, um, you know, I, I, in terms of timing, I do feel like, you know, I reached a point in my healing journey where, you know, I kind of reached a level of, of stability in, in both things. So um, in terms of my queer identity, you know, I felt comfortable in the lesbian label. It took me time to like even feel comfortable saying the word lesbian out loud. Um, but I was at that place when I wrote the book. I'm still, you know, still happy little lesbian over here. Um, and... Happy Little so, yeah. Lesbian needs to be a shirt. I hope so. I think I just, yeah, because like I, a lot of the unlearning sure. around lesbophobia specifically is like his, like culturally, the word lesbian has such, um, like it's very sexualized. Um, like even the fact that like, if you go on to Reddit, like r slash lesbians, it's not, it's not for us. It is performative it's it's performative sexuality targeted towards straight men um you know and and 
like even the way like if you look at TikTok, like the fact that the dollar bean like the reason that became a popular like meme and phrase is because the word lesbian was being restricted as like, oh, if there's the word lesbian in comments or uh, description, then that's considered more mature content. It's like, I'm not mature content. I'm a person, you know, <laughs> like gay is um, fine, but yeah. lesbian. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. And obviously, you know, all the word like queer, gay, bisexual, like all of those words they describe, you know, community and people and individuals, um, you know, and, and they describe like th those terms apply to, to teenagers who are, you know, like there's, there's bisexual teenagers, there are lesbian teenagers. I was one, you know, I just didn't know it, but I was, <laughs> you know, like, so it's, it's important for those terms to be, you know, I, I know that there are some queer individuals who shy away from the word lesbian and don't like to identify with the word lesbian because of how hypersexualized it is. And I totally understand that, totally respect their decision. Uh, for me, my personality is such that it's like, hey, I'm that thing. That's like, stop sexualizing that word. That's what, it, that's me. You know what I mean? I'm not going to shy away from the word. It is me. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I want to see the culture shift, not, not people who would otherwise identify as lesbians shy away from the word because of cultural um, perceptions, you know? Yeah, I actually love that you brought that up because I do have a question about that. And it's on page 93 where you talk about having a hard time with the word lesbian because of the depiction, depiction of that word in the media. And I felt just felt that was super relatable because I also had a hard time with the word lesbian until I started doing this podcast and it was just common because yeah. it's not common ish to hear it outside of the community. I feel like because of the connotation of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Gay or queer is much more sort of like commonly used. And I love queer. Like I love queer as an umbrella term because it's so inclusive and because it's inclusive of people who are like still figuring themselves out because that takes time. Um, but yeah, but I also really love the word lesbian and I'm like, Hey, you know, like, and I love all the memes around it. Like, let's go lesbians. And like, <laughs> there's one, I don't, I think it's from like a documentary or something. It's this older woman coming out of the van and she's like, where are my lesbians? And then all the young women just like flock to her. And I was like, I love this. That's from a movie called Pride. It's fantastic. It's like the gaze of lesbians for the minors. And this was like a real thing that happened during like a labor strike in England. And yeah, that's amazing. The, it's amazing. Okay. I get, I, I have to watch that. Go watch that movie. It's great. Yeah. But yeah, iconic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So but obviously we, you, yeah, like, we use the word queer to you, but we've actually, I've had people like the older generation of the LGBTQ community be like, oh, we don't like that word. So I feel like, there's still some people who do not prefer that word because of the way they were raised, because that was also used in a derogatory right. manner. Yeah, there's and that I mean that also. Language. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say there's just there's power in language, and there's something to be said about like taking words back and like, like you're saying, destigmatizing the word that was used not by the people who identify with it in a slanderous manner, like queer is common now when it used to be such a like a derogatory word like Caitlin said so exactly yeah. like I um in January my girlfriend and I started a podcast called just dyking around um because like I like the word dyke I think it's a fun word I totally understand for people who don't want to use it I totally understand I'm again my pers my perspective is I think words are worth reclaiming um if if you want to and i'm someone who wants to reclaim the word dyke because i think it's a fun word i think it is fantastic how many uh how many ways you can use it like alliteratively if yes. that's a word you know I and agree. like just play around with it like i just think it's a fun word definitely <laughs> um so back to the memoir um so you said that you basically just like build out your life story in a week which is admirable and that that tells me something that like perhaps it was just like ready to come out at that particular time when you sat down to write it 
So because you were writing something that was really focused on yourself, did you learn things about yourself while you were kind of like, I don't know, like putting your life on the page? Yeah, um, I think that... I think what I noticed more is like the healing that came with getting it onto the page and also in the review process. Um, so, you know, as I was writing, I was doing my best to like describe things, you know, beat, beat by beat as they happened. Um, and then in the reviewing process, I, you know, like kind of shortened conversations and kind of was like, okay, from a, from a reader's perspective, how do I make this story flow the best, you know? Um, and so in, I think in doing that, kind of going through both experiences, one where I'm just like, almost like info dumping, you know, all, all of it. Um, and then in the editing process where I'm looking at it from like more of an objective perspective, because I'm kind of looking at it from like an outsider's perspective to see how the story flows. Um, there's a, there's kind of like a recognition, like as I was reading the story, as like, as if I was a reader, I was like, I, I developed a lot more sympathy for my younger self. Because I think, I think a lot of people who survive very abusive childhoods, um, especially childhoods where the abuse is predominantly emotional and verbal and not necessarily physical. Um, there is, even though I mean, there is some physical abuse too, but, um, uh, you know, but when it's when 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 the um when most of the abuse is emotional and and verbal there's this sense of you know well maybe it wasn't really that bad and like maybe i'm just making too big of a deal out of this and like you there's a there's a tendency to kind of self blame and and to kind of beat up your younger self for what happened and so in, you know, obviously therapy helped me a lot uh, with that as well. Um, but also, yeah, like reading the story and, and just kind of, I don't know, I, I was able to develop more sympathy for my younger self of like, yeah, she, she was really just trying to, trying to survive and trying to get through all of this. Yeah, that definitely, so that you mentioned kind of like the the tendency to be like, well, maybe this was my fault. That definitely came through in the writing and that felt very like authentic because that's like, that's like a common trauma response to just be like, once you're out of the moment, be like, well, maybe it wasn't so bad, you know, and like, it's, yeah. it's fine now because, you know, you're in a, in a survival mode basically and you don't realize it. And so like, reading that from a child's perspective was really interesting, like, especially in the younger years was like very interesting. And yeah, <laughs> like it. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. And I mean, that's extremely common. Like every abuse survivor I've spoken with, you know, whether that abuse happened in a family relationship, um, a you know romantic partnership, um, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's part of the abuse cycle, right? Yes. There's the, there's the uh, abusive episode, and then there's the, um, like, like reconciliation, you know, mm -hmm. where the abuser, things feel better, um, and the abuser is nice, and you're like, oh, okay, that, that wasn't that bad, like, you know, there, you know, I, I shouldn't have said X, Y, Z, or I shouldn't have done whatever, um, and if I just, you know, if I, if I just tried harder, and, you know, was a better daughter or partner or you know whatever uh then it'll be better next time you know and you just and it just keeps happening um and then eventually you're like wait a minute this is not no matter what i do this keeps happening so maybe this actually isn't about me at all all right to pivot a little bit so in the book you mention you mentioned media quite a bit like you mentioned tv shows and movies um that kind of meant something to you at different points of your life so just since this is a media focused podcast curious how media like impacted your life immensely as you <laughs> ghostbusters on my wall um yes, there love she is that. <laughs> we have kim mckinnon in a suit we have pink in performing 
Um, we have, let's see, I have, uh, yeah, I've got a G flip over here. Oh, heck that's, yes. that's more recent one. They're just fun. Yes. Um, and, uh, so anyway, but yes, media, media has been, um, you know, made a, a massive, uh, difference. And, um, I mean, starting with, you know, when I, before I even realized that I was queer, you know, I had just gotten out of an abusive relationship, um, where I had been assaulted and it, I, I hadn't even come to terms with the fact that that had been an assault. I just was kind of in a, in a, in a sort of daze. And, uh, I discovered Pink's album Funhouse because it had just come out. And it was, it, her music gave me permission to feel so many emotions that I hadn't given myself permission to feel because uh, my mother never gave me permission to feel. And so yet having that catharsis through the music and, and also like I, you know, I, I, Pink became my special interest for a while. And so I was watching like every, uh, every interview with her I could find on YouTube. And this is back in like the early, early days of YouTube. Yeah. And, you know, and I was like, oh my God, she's, she's so smart and she's so thoughtful and she's so funny and she's so like honest and like raw in a way that you don't often see, especially in like celebrity interviews. And so I, I really looked up to her as like, that's, oh, that's, that's who I want to be as an adult, you know, cause I was, um, I was 19 at the time. And so, you know, I, I was still figuring out like who I wanted to be, what kind of person I wanted to be, like how I was going to fit into the world. It's like, oh, like, like that. I want, that's, I, I relate to that. And I also see so many values that I like want to embody more. Um, and so hearing through her lyrics, how she felt angry and sad and just like the angst and the, you know, just, there's just a lot of emotions there, um, that her music, her music was the catalyst for me giving myself permission to feel those emotions and feel those feelings. Um, so yeah, that was, that was, you know, her music was and continues to be just impactful and, and means a lot to me. Um, and then I, if, if it weren't for Kate McKinnon, I might still be closeted, uh, which is really sad to think about, but. Go Kate McKinnon. <laughs> yeah, no, truly. Um, yeah. And specifically if she wasn't out. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I didn't watch SNL or like, I had no idea who she was, but Ghostbusters came out, the female Ghostbusters. And of course, you know, misogynists were mad about it. So I was like, well, I got to give it my money then. Yes. And so <laughs> I went, I went to see the theaters on like the opening weekend. And as soon there's like a scene where Aaron Gilbert, you know, confronts, confronts Abby and then, um, you know, kind of stumbles into meeting uh, Jillian Holtzman. And just as soon as Kate McKinnon, because Kate McKinnon plays Jillian, as soon as Kate McKinnon came out, I was, it was just like a, like, I don't know how to describe it. I was a, like transfixed by her. I was just like, I, I can't even explain it. It was something about just how she embodied the character and how she expressed herself. And I, I related to Jillian Holtzman so much. And so I, I came home and like no one else, because this is the opening weekend, so no one else I knew had seen the movie yet. And I, you know, I was like, I need to fangirl about this. And so I went to Tumblr because that's the home of the fangirl. There you go. And, uh, and I just followed like every Jillian Holtzman, Kate McKinnon blog I could find. Um, and, you know, and then I was like, oh, like I'm, everyone else is queer, is sapphic. And also I was learning terms like queer and sapphic. Like I just, you know, prior to that, I was just a really, a really strong ally to the community. <laughs> A, such a good ally. <laughs> um, and, you know, so I was, I was learning these terms that were more open than, you know, gay, lesbian, bi, that's it, you know? And, uh, 
but I, you know, I, I, I had only dated men like up till that point. Um, and so I, like, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I was like, well, I've dated men, so I can't be gay because I've dated men. And, uh, you know, and so I was just, I was just going along, you know, just fangirling over Kate McKinnon and Jillian Holtzman. And that's where I found out that Kate McKinnon herself is a lesbian. And I was like, huh, you know, and I'm, I'm watching interviews with her. And it's the same thing as like what happened with Pink, where like, I'm just like, oh my God, she's so funny. And she's so like, like off the cuff and just like very sweet and very, I, I just related to how she presented in these interviews and, and not um, afraid to be herself. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And also what I noticed is, you know, she was, she had done all of this, um, all these interviews with other cast members from Ghostbusters and especially she and Leslie Jones, they have a very like cuddly dynamic. And I hadn't really like thought about this, like this hadn't really come to the front of my mind until I was seeing Kate McKinnon, a node lesbian, um, you know, interact in such a platonically, of, but like physically affectionate way with her castmates. And I was like, Les lesbians can do that? Like, lesbians can like, be physically affectionate and like a non-sexual, like just, just, you know, be like cozy with their friends, essentially. Without and having them be like, oh, you're coming on to me. Right, right. Without how, without it being like, you know, because like, honestly, prior to that, like I, I had watched the L word and, but mm -hmm. that, you know, like the L word is like my, that, that was the most I knew about lesbians, basically. Right. It's a frame and, of reference you know, that should not be a frame of reference. <laughs> right. It should not be. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's no. fun for what it is like, you know, but yes, this should not be your sole reference for right. what lesbianism is. And it, I mean, it's a soap opera. Let's call it what it Correct. is. It's a soap opera. And so totally. when you have a soap opera, like it's very, you know, like anytime two female characters make eye contact with each other, you know, That's they're going to fuck within the next exactly. three episodes. It's like that, you know, and so it was, you know, it, it's, it's the way that sex was portrayed. I, I have many feelings and thoughts about how the sex is portrayed in that show, because on the one hand, um, <laughs> I think it's valuable to show how lesbian sex can work because so many people do not know that. Um, and I don't think that real life lesbians should bear the brunt of that, you know, in terms of being asked, I don't know, in the middle of a fucking Trader Joe's, hey, how do lesbians have sex? It's like, I don't, you know, and, all, and porn is clearly not doing its job of showing how lesbian sex actually works. So I think that there's a lot of value in creating media and content that you know, show two women having sex in a more realistic way. Obviously, it's all Hollywood and whatever, but like in a more accurate way, um, while also, you know, showing stories and having it be an interesting, you know, storyline or whatever. Um, but uh, it, you know, that's, it's still not, there's value in the show and what it was for, you know, queer women of the time and all of that, but also not the best reference point for like lesbianism not the most accurate anyway that's all to say that um you know seeing kate mckinnon just exist uh was just i was having a lot of epiphanies about what it actually means to be lesbian um and i related to it a lot i i related a lot to to how she kind of moves through the world and then I saw a post because you know, I'm just on Tumblr and I, at this point, it's all just like, I, I'm just following like all Kate Holtzman fan blogs. So everyone's gay and sapphic. Uh, and so someone reblogs a post about compulsory heterosexuality and I'm just reading it. So I'm like, Oh, what's this? And I'm like, Oh, it's me. <laughs> and so it was, it was, it was like that. It was, it's a very, um, like I often compare it to, uh, that movie, the sixth sense where you get to the end. You're like, he was dead the whole time. That makes so much sense. Like I was a lesbian the whole time. I, that makes so much sense. That, that's I, of course. Yes. My whole life makes sense now. Um, and so that was the, 
that was the like it was Kate McKinnon, Jillian Holtzman, and then reading about Compet and being like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like I know this answer, but is there a piece of media that's out now that you wish was around when you were growing up? Gosh, so much. I mean, even, okay, so um, I wish, I mean, going back to like kids, more like uh, content directed more towards kids like Shira. I wish Shira had been around when yeah. I was like I know there was like an older Shira, but like the current Shira, the Netflix Shira. Yes. I wish that had been around when I was a kid. I wish oh god, there's uh, I'm trying to remember like all there's been so many oh uh Nimona. Yes. Oh. I wish that had been out when I was a kid. Oh, so um yeah just like there's so much there's so much Con there's so many like movies and shows that just show like to I mean so much <laughs> not as much as there should be but compared to when I was growing up like there's there's a lot more now um you know showing to girls like liking each other and you know um that I I wish like I wish I had known lesbianism was an option and being queer was an option um, and also part of that is I did grow up religious, so, you know, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know to what degree I would have been allowed to have watched these shows, um, when I was younger, but at least for them to have existed, there would have been a chance at me finding them. Um, and I think not only do I wish those shows had been around, but I also, around the early 2000s is when I was like, you know around those middle school years and there was such, like there was like the Britney and Madonna kiss there was Katy Perry's I kissed a girl like there was so much I don't know what I would to call it like I hesitate to call it sapphic representation but it kind of was like so much yeah. like sapphic representation that was like very intensely male gaze yes so it was very much, um, it was, it was, we, it, like, it was, in my experience, it was almost worse than if, if it had never been, like, shown at all, because to show, oh, this is what being a queer woman is, is, it's, it's to be further sexualized by men and and you know preyed upon by men it created this like internal like disgusted repulsion versus if i had you know if i had grown up just like not knowing what gay was at all i may have been able to like connect the dots and be like hmm i don't really feel that way about guys i do kind of feel that way about girls like you know what i mean like they're I may have had more room to like actually recognize my own feelings. Um, but because there, it, like, I think, yeah, the, 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 the representation that was out there was so harmful. It was, it, it was almost like more harmful than, you know, than, than to not have it at all. I think for me personally. Yeah. I, I remember that stuff. And then I forget, what was it? Tattoo also came out too, the fake lesbians. Yes. <laughs> the band of fake lesbians pretending to be lesbians. So yeah, I totally, yeah. it was, it was a weird time. The early 2000s was a weird time. Um, but I like your examples that you gave specifically of Nimona and uh, She-Ra because it goes back to what you were saying earlier. It was like, it, those are like age appropriate, ex like, um, representations of queerness because like she was like they're like young like young young adults and then like Nimona they're like a, a young adult in it like a child and then like older adults that are queer and so it's like and it's not the point of it is not the romance or like the sexualization of anybody it's just like a part of this just part of the characters and like yeah. it, it's normalization and presenting it in an age-appropriate way and I agree a lot of what I feel what we do on the podcast is like healing inner child because you didn't yeah. know any of this as a kid and so like yeah, exactly. Healing yeah. inner child and doing group therapy. That's yes. their podcast. Yes. <laughs> yes. Eden, you mentioned earlier that you have a podcast called Just Diking Around. Can you explain to us a little bit about your podcast? I would like to I would like to learn. Yeah, 
Yeah, so uh, so my girlfriend Jackie and I have been together for a couple years, um, and uh, I started falling down, prior to that, I kind of fell down a rabbit hole of like uh, Reddit React podcasts, um, and I just found them really entertaining. And I would like, you know, listen to these episodes, and then I would talk to Jackie about them, we would talk about their ridiculous stories, and, you know, just like, we would have our own full on conversations about it. And I was like, what if, what if, like, what if we started one? Um, and so that's, um, that's how that started. Uh, I was like with her in December, well, this past December. And then as soon as I, uh, came back home, cause we're long distance because we're lesbians. Um, <laughs> so, um, and so, you know, I came back home and we recorded our first episode and then, it's been, I've run, I'm working on episode, an editing episode nine now. Um, I had to take a little break because I started a new job and getting settled in and all that. But, um, but yeah, we understand. So it's, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we predominantly like read Reddit posts. I, I do my best to find ones that like don't sound completely, you know, creative writing practice. You know what I mean? Right. I do Fan my best to find posts. ones that are like, sound like feasible and like they even if this like even if that particular one might not be 100 accurate like we've we've seen these situ these kinds of situations happen you know we know people think like this kind of thing yeah um and you know but also like we'll also discuss like other things like if we watch like a queer show together it's very like queer centric of a podcast right so if we watch like a fun queer show, we'll talk about it um, or like a queer book or whatever. Like one of our recent episodes, we gave a shout out to like um, uh, Dating Unlocked, which is a queer show that we really enjoyed. Uh, it's Canadian. It's a reality dating show, but it's like done really well. It's really cute. Um, and then there um, I recently read a um, like a, a, a sapphic like romance no novella that was really good. Um, it's called Bespoke by L.M. Bennett is the author. Um, so, you know, I read a few excerpts and like give the author a shout out and all that. Um, so it's basically like queer content. If we don't have any, like, we don't have any, like, we don't have anything to talk about, we'll have picked out Reddit stories and react to those. If we have other things to talk about, like within the queer genre, we'll talk about that. That's awesome. We That's love fun. more queer shows. Exactly. Or yeah. queer media in general. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I I think it's so it's so valuable and also just really fun to do. Um, but, yeah, I also think it's valuable to just, like, have queer people just, like, tell our stories. And, um, you know, because there are, there are still so many people who are scared of the rainbow and scared of the queer community and... Um, you know, I, I think the more that we get to just like tell our stories and be like, hi, <laughs> I'm actually not the fucking man. Yeah. You We're know, not I the problem. Like, it's yeah, not us. exactly. Right. Like we, we just want to like, we, we just want to get married and like have a good life and like adopt some pets, you know, um, yes. maybe, you know, do some woodworking or something, you know, be just be gay and happy, but that's about it. I love it. Uh, you currently, I believe, live in San Francisco, which yes. has one of the gayest cities I have ever seen. Thank you, yes. Fiora. You're welcome. Um, yes. <laughs> how does it feel to live in this accepting place after growing up how you did? Um, it's really, really nice. Uh, it's really nice to, you know, I, so my day job is I'm a personal trainer and most of my clients are queer, um, which is just really, really nice to have that, like, not, I mean, not that it, um, how do I, you'll need to, like, cut all these pauses out, but, like, it's obviously, there's something about working with the queer population. Yeah, right, like, it, I guess what I'm trying to say is that when, yeah, okay, so this is what I'm trying to say when you're queer and you're in any workplace, there is this anxiety that can come up where it's like, how much 
you know, will I get fired? Or if it's, you know, a kind of job where you're working one-on-one -on -one with clients, you know, like how much am I compromising my finances by just like being honest and being like, you know, when they're like, oh, how was your weekend? You're like, oh, great. My girlfriend and I watched blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? Like it, talking about your, your partner is such a common part of just like everyday interaction between, you know, you and your coworkers, clients, what have you. And so there is this sort of like anxiety that can come up even in a place like San Francisco, you know, like where it's like, you still kind of like hesitate and are like, is, can I come out? You know what I mean? Like, can I say my girlfriend or da da da? And living in San Francisco, I feel very fortunate that, you know, that anxiety is much, much less than it would be if I was living in a more, you know, Republican minded uh, city. And, and so the fact that most of my clients are queer is, it, it just creates a level of comfort with both of us, you know, because both of us have had, you know, with, with each client, it's like both of us have had negative experiences uh, pertaining to, you know, coming out and all of that. And so it's, it's um, when, when we know that the other is queer, it, it just creates this level of comfort with each other. Um, and like, this is, this, you know, not to overuse this phrase, but like, this is a safe space, you know, kind of thing. Um, and so I feel very lucky um, that I can just be honest about my life and not have to worry about, I mean, cause I'm a terrible liar. I don't have the, I don't have, I'm not, I don't have a good enough memory to lie. <laughs> so, you know, if, if I had to like, if I was working somewhere where like I had to like catch myself and, and, and hide that part of me, it would be very, I don't think I'd last very long. <laughs> That's so why yeah, I add this podcast like as the first thing on my resume. So yeah. it that. just, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so yeah. So, and I've been very lucky that, you know, the, the gyms that I've worked at are very inclusive and very um, just, yeah, I, I've never, I have, I've been fortunate enough to never have in personally encountered an issue where, you know, my livelihood is uh, compromised because of my identity. Yeah, honestly, like, it's it having like grown up in the South and now living in a liberal city, like I completely understand how you feel. It's like a giant weight is lifted. Because like, literally, it's normal, nobody cares. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I lovely. Yeah, exactly. And I, um, you know, I've thought about returning to Massachusetts just like for fun like just to be able to show Jackie like this is where I grew up you know um have my Boston accent accent come out <laughs> all over again um you know but I do because I grew up in such a religious community like every time I think of you know going back home there's there's that like okay so like do I like is because, like, in a normal situation, if you're going back to a hometown where, you know, you had a couple of friends who still live there, you're going to naturally be like, oh, hey, I want to grab lunch with them, introduce them to my spouse, etc. But every time I think about returning to Massachusetts, I'm like, I don't know if I will reconnect with, you know, these families that I grew up around because I know they're religious and I don't know how they're going to respond to me being like, hey, me and my girlfriend, you know, are here. Um, you know, so yeah. then you get the like, people you know, who are straight and use the word girlfriend. So then they still won't think yeah. that you're talking right, about your exactly. girlfriend. And then it's That's confusing. true. But I think, I mean, yes. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that they will, I think, I think they'll, I think it'll be pretty obvious. Um, so yeah, but, but, but. Yes. But then also, that's also weird. You know what I mean? I personally, yes. I, I, I'm staunchly against it. I think straight women should choose a, just say best friend. Like, why do you have to say girlfriend? Yes. Why like, are we gendering only our female friends? <laughs> right? That's, Remember, exa like, that's my exactly. My boyfriend who's a when, boy and a friend. Exactly. 
it's so, so that's I think that's what it is. If straight women were out here calling all their male friends their boyfriends, I would be like, that's fine. Right, sure, okay, whatever. But just don't have a double standard, that's all. Correct. Love it. All right. Love it. I agree. All right, you mentioned earlier you're her personal trainer. You, like, guessed all our questions. Um, so you're a personal trainer and you created Fan Girlfriendness, which yes. we love that your tagline is Unleash Your Inner Superhero, because, like, yes. Um, so, okay, so why did you start this and, like, Ex- can you explain the, the concept of this to us? Yeah, so I I did not get into fitness or working out at all um, until I was in college. And it just, you know, working out became uh, an outlet for a lot of this anxiety and anger and all these feelings. And I could just go for a run and then the feelings would feel better um, because endorphins. And, uh, you know, it was, it was at that time I'm like trying to figure out what I want to do and... Um, I ended up randomly getting a job at a rock climbing gym, running like the kids programming. Uh, And which basically just means like, you know, uh, if there was like a birthday party, I would belay. So the belayer is the person standing on the ground, wearing the harness with the rope like tied in. And they're the ones basically making sure that the climber is is safe. My wife is a rock climber. I am the belayer. Exactly. Oh, rock climbing is so lesbian. Yeah. (laughs) It is. Um, anyway, yeah, no, I mean, like, it, the jobs that I had, the clothes I wore, like, the, the, I was living in a glass closet <laughs> the entire time. Anyway, um, so yeah, so I, I was uh, belayed for kids' per, uh, birthday parties, and also, like, there was, like, the summer camp, you know, I, would, I was in charge of the kids, and, you know. Um, anyway, so this was, I believe it was a birthday party, and uh, one of the girls who was so scared uh that like as soon as we tried to like put on the harness she just started crying because i mean it's it's scary you know if you're walking in you're a little you know eight-year-old you know it's big these big walls and you're expected to go all the way to the top and i mean we don't expect them to go all the way to the top but some parents can be you know um and you know and and she was scared so then and i was able to just like work with her one-on-one um and just you know kind of like gently coach her and make her feel really like at ease and and in working together I was able to kind of spark that um that interest and that like you know kind of sense of empowerment rather than fear and by the end of the two-hour session she was climbing halfway up the wall and just like you know look how you know getting to to, getting to, to, to the halfway point being like look how high I am you know kind of thing and so I was like, oh, I I want to, I want to, I want to do more of this. Like I, this is something I like this, this feeling. Um, and then there was another time when it was a birthday party and it was all girls. And, you know, at, in the beginning, you can kind of tell like there was a little bit more, not, there wasn't like intense clicks, but, but there was a little bit, you could tell a little bit, you know, clickiness. I mean, these are middle school girls. Like this is, unfortunately, it's pretty normal. Um, you know, but as we, you know, like only two girls could climb at a time, um, cause there were only two belayers. And so the rest of the girls were just sitting and kind of started to cheer on the climbers. And it became more of this like full group activity where like, as each girl went up, you know, they were being cheered on by the entire group. And it was such a lovely, it was just so lovely and wonderful. And I was like, yes, I want to do more of this, you know, um, and so I was thinking about how I could, how I could, you know, help other people feel physically empowered. Um, and I was like, what if, what if I became a trainer? Um, and so I looked, I looked into it and, you know, I looked into getting my certification. I got the, the textbook, the National Academy of Sports Medicine is the agency I went with. Um, and, you know, got the textbook, studied, took the exam, passed, and that's, you know, once you pass the exam, you're certified. Um, and then just started working with clients, you know, have, I've worked at like various different gyms. Um, and it's, it's, you know, the, the, like the fact that you're, anytime you're working with clients, you know, it's, it's not a clock in work eight hours, clock out. This is the same paycheck I get, you know, every couple weeks. I know what I, I know how much money I'm making. Like, it's not that it's very like, it's more like this. <laughs> um, yeah. 
and sometimes it's like this <laughs> and you know so it's 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 hard in that respect um but every time i'm working with a client i'm teaching a class uh because I, I got also a few years after getting certified i got my yoga teacher certification like it just i just like the i just really love the work like i just really love helping people and helping them feel empowered and you know and and connecting with them in such a you know it's it's a very like visceral way you know what i mean it's like you come in and a lot of times yeah you know, a lot of times my clients use it as sort of like a, a venting session you know they're venting about work and whatever job you know um and and so they get that kind of like uh, you know like a, a, a opportunity to just like vent and like unleash not unleash but like, like unload all of that and also they're getting to like release that physically as well you know stress anxiety all of that stuff you know they're, they're, it's, they're given that outlet um you know and they're also you know becoming more empowered as well you know every session brings them closer to the point where they can eventually just work out on their own because I've trained and educated them enough that, you know, they know how to, they know how to do stuff on their own, you know? Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's a really fun job. And I, I really, I really enjoy helping people this way. Um, what was, oh, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Did I answer your question? Just what's the concept of fangirl fitness? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so I came up with that because I mean I am a fangirl at heart, uh, and I also, again, I I got certified about like eight eight ish years ago, um, and so you know the landscape of the time back then, you know, Jillian Michaels was still very big. Like the whole perspective on fitness was very much like boot camp drill sergeant kind of there was starting to, like body positivity was like starting to be a thing but still there was very much this public perception of a trainer being like Ugh. you know what i mean like a big scary yeah. yeah um and so i wanted a name that would just like was a little cheek cheeky for, i you know i can tell but i like you know just diking around i, I like having fun um, and so, you know, so I wanted something that was like fun and like kind of making fun of myself a little bit, um, and also reflective of like who I am, um, and kind of indicating like, Hey, it's like, we're gonna have fun. You know what I mean? This isn't, I'm not, no yelling. It's, we're, we're all cool. Um, and so, yeah. So I was like, Oh, fangirl. Cause I'm a fangirl. I like, I'm a nerd. I like connecting with other people, you know, who, are also nerds and fangirls and all that. So that's what started. And I wanted something just like colorful. Like if you go to the website, you see it's very like kind of fun and colorful and playful. And that's, that's what I wanted, um, to, to kind of communicate through my brand. It makes it less intimidating. Nice. Yeah. yeah just love exactly. the whole thing. Yeah. Because like, you know, physical fitness is something that we're all, you know, we all deserve. Um, and it's become such as fitness and health and wellness has become like productized and like, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like as it's become, it's, it's been turned into this product by capitalism. Yes. It's this, it's like, there's all of this like shame and, you know, shaming and like just bullshit that's just tacked onto it. And you're just like, that's, that's bullshit. But if you don't know, you don't know that it's bullshit. Like, you know what I mean? And so, that's why like I, I see my job as like, I'm as much a teacher as I am like a, a trainer, you know, because most of my job is just literally teaching, like just teaching my clients, you know, this is, don't worry about this. This is bullshit. This is marketing. This is nonsense. And this is what is actually going to help you, you know, physically become stronger. You know, this is what's going to help your health, you know, and, and all of that. So, yeah. Well, thank you for setting the record straight as a healthcare professional. I appreciate that. Cause yes, there's a lot of garbage out there. 
So. And it's it's fun. I mean, like funny in like a depressing way. How like the same bullshit that like back in the ye old days of like Instagram and YouTube, like it it was there, and then now it's on TikTok. Like you're seeing, it's like the yeah. same. It's like reruns. You know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. it's like diet culture reruns, but just on TikTok instead of YouTube. You know? Yeah. And it's just yeah. It's. Yeah. Mm. With that said, I do also see a lot of, um, you know, like uh, a lot of other professionals. Um, mm-hmm. Like I love Brianna Jewell on YouTube. She debunks a lot of fitness nonsense. Um, you know, there's other trainers, nutritionists who, you know, have a similar approach to what I, to my approach, you know, and, and do their best to debunk a lot of that. And I've been really happy to see them have a lot of followers and have a lot of attention. So there's, you know... There's a lot of bullshit, but there's also a lot of people who are working to, to debunk all that and, and set the record straight as well. Well, thank you, Eden. That, those are all the questions we have for you. This was <laughs> truly fascinating. We appreciate getting to know you better and all the facets of your life. Um, before we close out the episode, do you have any final words or anything you'd like to say to the listeners at home? Not Yeah, nothing in particular. I mean, just... Um, just, I, I, I'm trying to think, like, I mean, I know it's, you know, cliche, whatever, but I, I think there's a lot of value in, uh, like, like, trusting, you know, trusting your gut, trusting your intuition, noticing that if you feel yourself being pulled in a certain direction, um, you know, like, Like, uh, years before I became a trainer, I, when I was in college, I wanted to uh, get my degree in kinesiology. I didn't know why. I didn't know what I would be doing with that, but I wanted to. Um, And it was my mom who convinced me that that would be a waste of time. Um, You know, and so, you know, and same thing, like, when I was growing up, like, there were these moments where I was like, I knew that this was bullshit. Like I knew that this was abusive. I knew this was messed up and I knew that I deserved better uh, than what I was getting in, in from my parents. And, but then like, you know, I, 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 I responded to myself with a lot of shame and being like, Oh no, you know, you're da, 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 da. And so I, I think that, if I had to give a piece of advice, it'd be like, if you feel yourself pulled in a certain direction and, and, and attracted to something and, but you're holding yourself back because you're feeling like this external shaming, this external kind of pushing you away from that. It's something worth investigating. You know, I think anytime you feel yourself pulled towards something, that's something to investigate. Well, thank you for that. We uh, great advice. Uh, we really appreciate again. Thank you for coming on the podcast. We appreciate getting to know you, and to everyone listening, be sure to check out uh, "Becoming Shameless." It is out. Uh, it is great, um, and just dyke it around for all fun extra queer content that Eden's putting out there. So until next time, everybody, hydrate for lesbian Jesus and gay it up all over the place. Bye. Bye. And with that, we've been Big Gay Energy. If you like this episode, check out all our other episodes right here on YouTube. Please like, leave a comment below, and subscribe for more amazing super gay content. If you'd like to support us, check out our merch store, or join our Patreon for early access to episodes, exclusive content, and so much more. Until next time, stay safe and hydrate for lesbian Jesus.